So today we get to start our trek through the book of Revelation in real, okay? And as we are going to start reading what Jesus revealed to us through John, we are going to find several themes that are going to be very apparent throughout the entire book. So we're kind of looking at it, just an overview right now, where we are going to get into chapter 1. But first off, we're going to see that this is a Christ-centered book. Now, it's granted that all Scripture speaks of Jesus. I mean, it's essentially from Genesis on, you see the way pointing to the coming of Jesus. But Revelation really magnifies the glory and greatness of Christ because it is a revelation of him. Remember, we said this before. This is not just looking at future events. This is a revelation of Jesus himself in his glorified state, as we are going to see. And another another theme is that unlike in the book of Daniel, and the book of Daniel, remember when we studied it at the very end, Daniel was told that it was to be closed up because the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. That was the book of Daniel. Here in Revelation at the very end, it's the exact opposite. It's an open book. John is told not to seal the book in chapter 22. And it's because it contains a message that God's people throughout all the ages need to hear. And Revelation, despite all the symbolism and all the kind of mysterious stuff that's going to jump up at us and kind of seem like, ooh, that's weird, it's, gonna, it's meant to be understood. And to be honest, there are going to be certain things in it that we're never going to comprehend. I mean, God is just that way. You know, why does a, a, a child who's done nothing wrong die of cancer? God has his reason. We don't know. We will not know these answers until we stand before him in in his throne room. But this is still, when John wrote this, the original people who are reading it, as we're going to see, are the seven churches in Asia. And it's going to be read to each one of these churches. Okay, the whole thing. The saints who are listening are going to understand enough of its truths that they're going to be extremely encouraged through their own difficult situation. We're going to get, we kind of looked a little at the historical stuff last week, but we're going to go a little bit more. And of course, what makes Revelation extremely fascinating and interesting, it is a book of prophecy. It's mentioned right here in chapter one. It's mentioned again several times. And granted that the letters to the seven churches we're going to read in chapters two and three deal with those immediate needs in those churches, there's still lessons that as a church today we need to learn and we need to hear. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were going through tribulation. We're going to be going through tribulation. In many ways, we already are. But yet we're going to see how the victorious Christ is presented in a way that the war is over. Yeah, the battle still rages on, but we won the war. This is something that so many Christians forget is that Satan hasn't won. He wants you to think he has. No, no, Satan's lost. That's the end of it. He is lost. He lost with the resurrection. Okay? He's trying to take as many humans down with him as he can. Mm -hmm. And he wants, in order to do that, he wants to neutralize believers. Yeah, he can't take their souls, but he can can lessen their impact. He can neutralize their their witness in such a way that he's not going to lose anymore. And the thing is, we shouldn't let that happen. That's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why we read this book, is to remember, no, we are on the winning side. Amen. Okay? If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead. And if you haven't done so already, turn to Revelation chapter 1. We're starting in verse 1. The last point, as you turn there, the last point that we're going to see about Revelation, again, the theme that goes through all this book, is it is a relevant book, even today. What John wrote about that would shortly come to pass, because the time is at hand, he writes this in in this very beginning, and we have to remember that the word shortly doesn't mean soon or immediately, but quickly and swiftly. Now, God doesn't measure time like we do. 
Okay, first or Second Peter says, you know, you know, a thousand days are as a year, years a, 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 a thousand years is as a day. And we also have no clue when Jesus is going to return. <clears throat> but when he does, when he starts, as we're going to see in chapter four, when he starts, and the, the tribulation and all that's going to happen, it's going to occur swiftly, quickly. And without any interruption. Once the end happens, it's going to be fast. So, Revelation chapter 1, looking at verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Okay? Now, as we saw last week, just to give a little review, the word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, which means unveiling or revelation just means something that was previously unknown is now made known. And, of course, this is the root word of the current English word apocalypse, which is kind of a synonym today for chaos and catastrophe. That was never what it was intended to be. The verb just means to uncover, to reveal. And in this book, the Holy Spirit is going to be pulling back the curtain and giving us the privilege of seeing, first off, the glorified Christ in heaven, and secondly, the fulfillment of his sovereign purposes in the world. Okay? Now, how did the Lord convey this message to John? Well, it says it right here in, in the first two verses. The Father gave the revelation to the Son, and the Son shared it with the Apostle, sometimes using his angel as an intermediary. Sometimes Christ did it himself. And then there is oftentimes there's a different angel made a message or sometimes an elder came along and we'll talk about who the elders are in a second and sometimes there was a voice from heaven that told john what to say or do ultimately probably the voice of god doesn't matter how he got it it came from god and it was all inspired by the holy spirit and that's part of the reason why he wrote this was to basically say look this is inspired this is inspired this is from God. You can trust this. Now, he mentions the word signified. Now, this is important because it means to show by a sign. Now, this, the noun form, you know, this is back in the schoolroom now, the Greek word that's translated as in, in here actually has three different meanings. It's used three different ways. It could be a sign, it could be a wonder, or it could be a miracle. And coincidentally, and this is another one of those bits of information that ties Revelation to the Gospel of John is John uses the same word in his Gospel to describe the miracles of Christ. Because his mir- Jesus' miracles were not just displays of power. They carried a much de- deeper spiritual message. Okay, And the same thing with the signs that are being revealed here in the book of Revelation is the same thing. It's not a display of power, though it indeed does display power there's much deeper spiritual meaning. Now, we're going to run across a lot of symbolism. And, of course, some people would ask, why the symbolism? Well, we kind of answered that a little bit last week, but we'll kind of go into a little more detail now. One of the reasons is it becomes a spiritual code, okay? And it would be known to those who know Christ personally. Now, why would this be important? Well, remember, persecution was happening to Christians at this point in Roman history. And so if some Roman official got a hold of the book of Revelation and wanted to try to use it as evidence against Christians, he wouldn't, couldn't be, he wouldn't be able to do it because he couldn't understand it. Okay, it was a puzzle, it was an enigma. And so it would be worthless to him to try to, to cause issues with it. Okay, but the symbolism there's another reason, is it doesn't weaken with time. There are so many images that 
John is able to draw upon from Revelation, and he's going to assemble them into an exciting drama that has encouraged persecuted and suffering saints for centuries to this very day. However, keep in mind, just because he's using symbolism doesn't mean the events that are being described are not real. Remember we talked about that least at last week with preterists and so forth, or the idealists actually. No, they are very real, extremely real. Okay, another reason to use symbolism, they, they arouse emotions, okay? For example, John could talk about, oh, there's going to be a dictator who's going to rule the whole world. Sounds bad. Yes, it is. But instead, he describes this dictator as a beast, okay? The symbol, that symbolism says much more than the mere title of a dictator, okay? You think about a beast, you don't think of a, you know, a nice, cuddly teddy bear, okay? You think of something that is not, you know, maybe Godzilla or something like that, something that you don't want to have around, okay? Now, John also, he uses as symbolism uh, the, the, the future world system, and he uses the term Babylon the Great, okay? And he does a contrast between the harlot of Babylon and the bride of Christ. Now, why would he do this? Well, the name Babylon, well, it conveys deep spiritual truth to anybody who's read the Old Testament. If you go back to Genesis 10 and 11, okay, they're talking about the Tower of Babel and so forth. Babylon has always been used as a symbol of rebellion or uh, uh, basically a, almost a personification of rebellion. And you can see it all through scriptures until you get even right here. Babylon is mentioned again. But keep in mind, as we study this, don't let your imaginations run wild, okay? We have all this symbolism is interpreted by the Bible itself, okay? And we've talked about this so many times. If an interpretation to a vision in Revelation or in, say, Daniel, it says such and so, that's the same interpretation if it shows up again in Revelation. Oh, no, it's different this time. Oh, no, it's not, okay? Uh, a good example, of course, was Babylon. Babylon's always been a representation of evil. Now, in Revelation, some of these are explained. Others are understood because, oh, yeah, the Old Testament said that this beast is going to be like this. Okay, I would get that. It represents a person because in Daniel, all the beasts represent people. Okay, that makes sense. And there are some that are not going to be explained. But keep in mind that there are over 300 references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation alone. That's a lot. So we have to anchor our interpretations to what God has already revealed to us. Else, what's going to happen? We're going to misinterpret this very important book. That's why if people were wondering, or if they've forgotten, either way, we went through Daniel. We went through Ezekiel. We went through Zechariah before we even hit this point. Why? So now it's going to make more sense to us. Well, I wasn't here when you did that. Fine, it's on YouTube. You can go back and listen to them. Okay? It's there. So if you have any missing pieces, that's how you're going to deal with those missing pieces. Now, as I mentioned, this being an open book, of course, we said that the books was sent to the seven, the seven churches in Asia. These were actual local churches. And that map I gave you kind of shows where they are. Okay, there we go. All right. But being an open book, this means that it, it's not the only, that the, 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 uh, the words are not limited to just those seven churches. Anyone can read it. And what's nice is this book has a blessing for anyone who reads the book and obeys its message. Okay? Interesting point here. The Greek word for read is to read out loud. Okay? It's interesting. Read and read in English, mean, they can mean both things. But there's a different word for it in Greek. Why? Because a large number of people in that era were illiterate. And so Revelation would be read aloud in local church meetings. Another reason for those who were literate 
it took time to copy these things. They didn't have printing presses or Xerox machines or, or copiers and what have you. They, if you wanted a copy of this, and it's a long book, you had to do it by hand. So for the most part, stuff like this was read out loud. This applies to everyone. Okay, yeah, I, we read it out loud, but also you can read it yourself. You happen to have a copy. Now, one purpose that's not here, this is not a purpose of Revelation, was to satisfy the curiosity of those seven churches about their future. On the contrary, it had a totally different meaning. This is AD 95 when this was written, the closing years of the first century, and persecution from Rome had gotten into full swing. It started actually about 30 years earlier under Nero, but all these different emperors after, afterwards, just some of them were insane, some of them just into themselves. It got to the point where they would demand that people worship them as gods, and the Christians would not do so. I mean, literally, they, you would, it, it wasn't like it was a big deal either. You walk in, and you pin, took some incense, you burned it on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord, and you walk on. Christians wouldn't do that because Caesar is not Lord. Only Jesus is Lord. And people were being arrested and, yes, dying because of this. So writing this book is essentially telling those churches that are being severely persecuted to the point of death. And we're going to read that in chapters 2 and 3, what's happening in some of these churches that it's giving them strength and hope. Several times there are promises. If you make it through, not only are you going to be fine, you're going to be glorified. And, there, and I'm not going to go through all the quotes because the quotes won't make sense until after we read chapter 1 completely. Okay? But there also, the book was also pointing out some issues. Okay, in chapter two, 2 and 3, talk about those issues. Even though they zero in on individual churches, well, they can apply to any church in any age. Well, it could happen. And again, when we get to that point, we will see it. But like anything in Scripture, the blessing comes not just by hearing it or reading it. It's by doing it. Okay, Actively doing what you've learned. So, moving on, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Stop there. Okay? So the seven churches that are in Asia. This is the first mention of the number seven in terms of counting. In this book, seven crops up repeatedly. You have seven churches. You have seven spirits. You have seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven stars, seven lampstands. And a bunch more that we're going to talk about when we get there. Now, why is seven important? In Jewish numerology, seven is the sign of fullness and completeness. Okay? This goes, the shows of God being fullness and his completeness of his plan. That's why the number seven is there. This has always been true. Some people say, well, why do we have seven weeks in the year? Because God created it. It created the world in six days and rested the seventh because it was completed. Okay? So seven's always been a, an important number. Now, I mentioned last week how schol the modern scholars try to lump Revelation with Jewish apocalyptic literature, and we went through that last week. The first clear sign of this fallacy, how we know that they are wrong in this position, is the greeting at the very beginning. Grace and peace. 
Okay? This is the typical greeting of all the, almost all the other New Testament letters. Okay? Grace was Roman, or was uh, Greek, actually. And, of course, peace was from Jewish, shalom. Okay? This was a typical Christian greeting. And all the letters of the New Testament, the exception is Hebrews, because Hebrews doesn't have a beginning, a greeting at the beginning, which is one of the reasons why people are not sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. God knows. People have their ideas. It's, we're not going to go into those today. But these seven churches, okay, it's a re- they're real churches. They were real churches back then. Most of them are gone now because uh, it's now part of Turkey. Now, a lot of people at this point say, oh, we have a question. Why did John address just these churches and only these seven churches that we see up here? Because there were other churches in Asia. Now, Asia is the green portion of, uh, of the map. Even though we think of Asia as this huge continent, the Romans actually, the green area on the map was the Roman province of Asia, okay? In fact, this little, you know, they call the whole Turkish peninsula Asia Minor, and that's kind of what they referred to it as. So keep that in mind. We see about the churches in Asia. They're talking about the province here. But there were other churches. We know there was a church in Colossae, okay? Paul wrote a letter to them. Uh, there, we knew there was one in Troas. Uh, Paul stopped there for a time to, uh, uh, to uh, encourage the brethren there. We read about that in Acts 20. And Hierapolis, there was another one that's there. So that's mentioned in the book of Colossians. But why? Why just these seven? Well, sorry, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Yeah, that's just the way it is. You don't... You don't, there is no clear answer in the scripture. It's more of a transportation issue in that I think because it's not exactly port side, I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm just saying there was a lot of... Obviously, the rest of those churches, apparently he could have used those, but for some reason he did it. Now, the, the order in which they were brought up, mentioned, does follow a trade route. Okay, you can actually go from Ephesus up to Smyrna and, and so on back and, and then circle back to it. That, was, that probably is why they were brought, brought in the order they were. But Colossae had issues too. Okay, Paul was writing a letter for that very reason. But there is no clear, the Bible doesn't say God chose these seven churches because, because there is a lot more than seven. But the main reason, Ephesus was actually the big church. That was the one that essentially planted all the rest, okay? Because as we're going to see, Ephesus is a big city. It was the metropolis of, Asia, of the province of Asia. It was the capital, okay? That's where the governor reside, and it was a cross, there were crossroads there. But Laodicea and Colossae are right next to each other. So it's not, you know, again, it's not like that had anything to do with it. But it's like, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm saying that God knows, okay? And this is one of those things that we don't need to worry too much about. It. Just know that he chose them for a reason. To be honest, the reason might be because they had interesting characteristics that he wanted to, pair, to point out, as opposed to the other churches which may not have been showing some of those characteristics. Now, some people, for example, some people see the seven churches as this panorama of church history, okay? You had the church of Ephesus, which was the apostolic, the early church, and then you have the modern-day lackluster and lukewarm church of Laodicea that we deal with today. Now, it could illustrate that there is enough in my mind, I can't discount it, but what happens is one, there are churches in every age that that show all seven of these characteristics which we're gonna go through. Mm -hmm. There are churches who are on fire but have lost their first love today, okay? There are lukewarm churches today, okay? There and there's all the ones in between. They have. We have the persecuted church. Okay? 
maybe not in this country, but they're there. Mm -hmm. they're, in, they're in a lot more places than people are willing to admit. Mm -hmm. Okay? But the real lesson here, too, there's another lesson is Jesus knows what's going on in each congregation and our relationship to him and his word determines the life and ministry of the local church. Uh, when, you know, the, 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 we're going to see this in the next chapter is talking about removing a lampstand. Each lampstand, according to later in verse one, represents each church. Removing the lampstand is paramount to closing the church or letting it die, okay? Why? Because they are no longer following Christ as closely as they should. Um, we're going to see it. We're going to see it, and we are going to say, yeah, I understand what he's saying because I've seen examples of these churches around me. And yeah, you can honestly go through and say, yeah, I can see the same phases in church history. Okay? You can see the Church of Philadelphia, a church that, you know, in, in renewal, you look at the church of the 18th, of the 19th century after the different revivals to the 19th century, you see it go up and up and up and then you start to see it go back downhill and delay it to see it. Whether that was intended by God, he knows, but I see that pattern. But again, I also see the same pattern with individual churches. And the number seven, of course, that just goes in with the rest of the theme of of, of sevens, the uh, number of completeness. It rounds out. It's kind of a liter of a literary nature. It rounds out uh, the other sevens in the book, okay? And as I mentioned, you know, the order, that's because they just happened to be along a path that it was easy to take. So when the letter goes around, you can almost imagine this happening. Okay, Ephesus is mentioned first. The first place they go is Ephesus. They read it to the church. Then they go to Smyrna. Then they go on and on until finally Laodicea. They get it at the very end. Okay? Now, there's a blessing after the grace and peace part. There's a blessing by the Trinity. Huh? From him who is and who was and who is to come. Well, that's God the Father. Okay? From the seven spirits before his throne. God the, the Spirit, Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, God the Son. Okay? We know that God is almighty. He is the eternal one. That's why he uses that formula for who is, who was, and is to come. And we see it later for the almighty. And all of history is part of this plan. History is his story. And unfortunately, the persecuted church is part of that plan. Okay? Now, if we're talking about the Holy Spirit, mentions the seven spirits before the throne. Well, if it's just talking about one Holy Spirit, why seven? Um, John is actually making a mention of Zechariah 4. Don't have to turn there, but you may remember when we went through Zechariah, in chapter 4, Zechariah had a vision of a lampstand with seven bowls. And from the, the oil to the bowls were supplied from two nearby olive trees, okay? And so John is, is actually connecting this with the lampstands that we're gonna read about very quickly, that these are part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit because oil has always been a symbol of the Holy Spirit, okay? The seven spirits represent the activity of the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit in all those churches, and, and this is important because just as was said in Zechariah 4, the churches operate not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That's Zechariah 4, 6, okay? There also is a reference to the seven spirits in Isaiah, Isaiah eleven two. 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Messiah, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, there's two, Spirit of counsel and might, there's two more, and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, two more, and the spirit of the Lord and the last one. And this is a, a prophecy of the Messiah. So this reference to the Holy Spirit is showing perfection in the manifold ministry of the Holy Spirit. Again, there's their symbolism. And then, of course, the Son makes his greeting. 
Jesus Christ in his office as prophet, the faithful witness, as priest, the first begotten from the dead, and the king, prince of the kings of the earth. Now, when we talk about the first begotten or firstborn, that doesn't mean he was the first one raised from the dead. We actually know that not to be true. There were, before Jesus was raised from the dead, there were two, at least two more. Okay? No, this is a title of honor. The firstborn was, was honorable, was of high honor. You were the heir to the household. If you were the firstborn in a family, you were the one that inherited everything. Okay? So it was a title of honor in that culture. Okay? And then what does John do? He's talking about Jesus and he bursts into praise. Talk about spontaneous worship. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, even though here in the New King James, it says to him who loved us, the Greek is not in the past tense. The Greek is always rendered in the present tense. In fact, most English translate, modern English translations will say this to him who loves us, indicating Jesus is still alive. And yes, he still loves us. And there is a footnote in your Bible for the New King James that clarifies it. Okay? Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter the, the persecutions, banishment, and so forth. John is telling the believers that you are under Christ's love and his care. And he transformed you through the shedding of his blood. And even though he died on the cross, he rose again. That defeated the, the devil. And if you follow Christ, you're going to be victorious. Again, this is a, a, a way of saying, hang in there, guys. You're on the winning side, and this is why. Amen. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Jesus called, or God called Israel to be a kingdom of priests in, in Exodus 19. He loved them, but they failed. So God took the kingdom from them, and God's people today, the church, are his kings and priests, exercising spiritual authority and serving God in this world. Now, again, this is something that we have to make sure we remember. This doesn't mean that the new people of God replace the ancient Jews in the purposes of God. That's replacement theology. It is a heresy. No, we did not replace the Jews in the promises of his covenant. They still will get there. They're still part of the apple of God's eye. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go into that. We've actually spent several times talking about this issue. So when Christ returns, behold, he is coming. Anyone who says that Christ never said he was coming back, excuse me, that's pretty straightforward and clear. Behold, he is coming. Mm -hmm. Okay? Amen. Now this isn't the rapture. Okay, some people say, oh, that's, that, that's that talking about the rapture. And this, in fact, this is where a lot of them say, oh, the rapture and the second coming are the same. No, it's not, okay? The rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. It's also, he comes as a thief, as it is said. That means that only believers are going to see him and be affected by it. Exactly. Now, there's different, you know, movies who have, you know, like Left Behind, uh, a Thief in the Night, a few other movies of this genre. Basically, no one knows what's going on except for the people who just suddenly disappear and vanish. That's pretty much true. People are going to be in chaos. People don't know. You know, uh, There's an old song, I wish we'd all been ready. I don't know how many people remember that from the 70s. Okay, There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. Man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise. She turns her head. He's gone. That is the truth. That is an interesting, it's a song that came out, you know, like I said, I think it was back in the 70s. Yeah. And, uh, but it's an interesting truth. But it's not the second coming. The event that's described right here is going to be witnessed by everyone. Yes. It, every eye will see him. Address a statement by one group of people. Well, let's just give them a name, Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe Christ came back spiritually back in 1914. And their, their uh, justification is when they said every eye will see him, 
they say, well, you see the word see there doesn't mean with your eyes. It means you understand, like, oh, I see, said the blind man. Okay, it's, it, it's like, yeah, you understand it. That's why they'll see them. Sorry, guys, the Greek doesn't allow that. The Greek means you're using your eyes to see something visually. Nice try, doesn't work, okay? Especially Israel is going to see him. And in fact, we've read about that in Zechariah. We read about that in Matthew 24. We read about that in Daniel, okay? At the end of the tribulation period, Jesus will descend, split the mountain all, Mount of Olives in half. He will save his people and establish his kingdom. And to be honest, a lot more of this is gonna be described here in Revelation. It's gonna be a supernatural return, physical. He's gonna be in the clouds. Everyone's gonna see him even those who put him to death. Now, not, you know, I don't think, and most scholars don't think, that it was the literal Pilate, Caiaphas, and Ananias, or the Sanhedrin in Jesus' time. They're long dead by the time this happens. But these are people who represent the Jewish nation. They taught over the years, Jews taught that Jesus was not the Messiah. And when the time comes, and there he is, and they see the nail prints in his hands, the Jews are going to say, ooh, we were wrong. They were right. They're going to mourn. But not just the Jews. That was mentioned in Zechariah 12. It's going to be everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Which means everybody is guilty to some extent of the crucifixion of Christ. But of course we are. If we weren't sinners, there would have been no reason for him to die on the cross. Mm -hmm. he, he was on the cross because of what we did. Even though he hadn't done it at the time we weren't even thought of. Okay? It doesn't matter. That's Everyone is going to mourn over that. And these are, again, the church is going to be gone. This doesn't apply. To, this only applies to the unsaved or the, those who are still on the earth. And then God speaks up now. He puts his stamp and approval. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay, Alpha and Omega. It's first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. Today we'd say A to Z, okay? This tells us that God is at the beginning of all things and also at their end. Now God, this is an interesting point. God the Father is called Alpha and Omega twice in Revelation, but this is also applied to the Son twice in Revelation. Good argument for the deity of Christ. And the title, the first and the last, goes back to the Old Testament in three different places in the book of Isaiah. Just another, and this is applied to God at that point. This is another proof that Jesus is God for those who want to deny his deity. Jesus is the eternal God, unlimited by time. He's the almighty, able to do anything. And we're going to see almighty is a key name for God all throughout this book of Revelation. So there's his prologue. Let's jump into his visions. I, John, in verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Christ, Jesus Christ, was on the island of Patmos, that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. <clears throat> Stop there. There's a lot here. Okay, John identifies himself again and tells us why he's there. Now, if you look at your map, okay, Patmos is right there. Okay, here's Ephesus. Here's Miletus, which is, a, which is the kind of the major port in this area. Mm -hmm. Patmos is about 37 miles away from that point. It's a volcanic island, kind of rocky, about 10 miles long, and at the north end, about six miles wide. Nothing too terribly wonderful about it. Um, it was used at that point as a Roman penal colony. Uh, but not for common criminals. But it was more for political prisoners, such as John himself. Um, 
Now, why was he there? Well, we all know. Well, he was arrested because of the testimony. Well, he says that because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. What he's trying to tell people, I wasn't there on a missionary trip. I was arrested. I was sent there. This is his way of explaining what's going on. Uh, I'm there because of religious and political persecution to my faith. Okay? So, but it seems like he has a pretty good attitude about this. Okay? Because he, he combines this with what's going on in Asia with the persecution of the church. Because he talks about how he's sharing their suffering, which is through his faithfulness to God. You know, he tells them, we're sharing the kingdom together. Okay? You reign, though you're suffering, because you reign, you have Christ reigning in your lives. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, but you could still go through it and still not be too unhappy about it. Okay? And then he's telling them, be patient. He's talking about, yeah, I'm here. Oh, well, I'm here. And he's kind of saying, you guys are there. You guys are suffering persecution. Deal with it. Be patient. You're going to get a reward later. It's like you put your full confidence in Christ. You're going to suffer things with dignity. You think about Stephen before the Sanhedrin, how he's described in the book of Acts as looking like he was an angel standing there. They're wanting to kill this guy. And they say, okay, well, tell us, your, tell us your testimony. And he says, okay, let me talk to you about the history of Israel. And he did it like a lecturer, very confident, very cool, very collected. I mean, toward the end, he started getting a little, little uh, spicy, okay? But he never did anything to show that he was scared, that he was cringing in terror because they might kill him. If anything, he tries to antagonize them toward the end. You, you know, basically like Jesus, you're Brit of vipers. Not a great way to make friends and influence people. Okay? And there were several things that happened to Christians in this period in Roman. Not only imprisonment. That's just the, one of them. You could be ostracized. Okay? Your neighbors refuse to have anything to do with you. You go to a store. No one will sell things to you. Okay? There's slander. People talk about you behind your back. You know, people are hostile to you. You had people disrupting church services. You had false prophets trying to insert themselves to cause problems. There was even mob violence. They found out you were a Christian. You might find, you know, a bunch of people with pitchforks and torches at your door ready to kill you. Okay? And, of course, the government wasn't on your side. This is what these guys were going through. And it's like, no, be patient, endure to the end. And we're going to see that over and over again in the next two chapters, chapters two and three, because that mark of patience and long suffering and confidence in one faith is a mark of Christ's rule over your life. Because a lot of times God uses suffering to test and purify the loyalty of his servants, Okay. But he, that's because he's allowing his strength to be revealed through weakness. That's how he always works. Now, John goes on. He's saying, okay, I, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then he begins to describe what he's doing. Uh, he, as usual with Revelation, there's no simple opinion on what he was talking about here. Um, some people think he, he was being transported into the world of prophetic visions by the spirit of God. And this is, there is biblical precedent for it. Ezekiel, this happened to Ezekiel, this happened to Paul, okay? Maybe, but that doesn't seem to fit in this, in this part of the book. It doesn't seem to work this way. One that I tend to favor, and a lot of people agree with me on this one, is John was worshiping the Lord with his thoughts and mind completely on his Savior without distraction, kind of like what we were talking about earlier today. That, hey, it's the, day, it's the Lord's day, so I am just going to sing to myself. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to be like Paul and Silas in that Philippian jail for the, you know, after I've been beaten with rods, and I'm just going to praise the Lord, sing praises, just worship him. Makes sense to me. Now, what about this expression, the Lord's day? This is the only place in the New Testament that phrase is used. Now, 
Some people say, oh, that must mean the day of the Lord. No. Here's why. He never uses that, that phrase, the day of the Lord, anywhere in Revelation. Okay? So therefore, we can probably say, probably not. Oh, how about the Sabbath? Okay, the seventh day, what we would call Saturday. Nowhere in the, Jew is, nowhere in the Bible is the Jewish Sabbath known as the Lord's Day. Okay? And despite what some Christian groups try to teach, the Sabbath was a sign of a covenant between God and Israel, not God and the church. Okay, only God and Israel. And the New Testament's very clear that if a Christian does want to uh, observe the Sabbath, you can if you want to. You're not required to, though. Okay. Uh, Acts 15, just give you an example. You know, they, they, we, when we studied Acts, this was when the Judaizers were trying to make the Gentiles become Jews by following, getting circumcised and following the Jewish laws. And one of the big ones among the Jews was you observe the Sabbath. Well, they heard from Peter, they heard from Paul, and they made the decision was, no, they don't have to. But they gave them a list of things, hey, this is what, probably what you should stay away from and things you should do. And it's very important to note that observing the Sabbath wasn't one of them, okay? So what was the, the Lord's Day? Well, if you really look at early church fathers, it's the first day of the week. What we call Sunday, today, okay? That was commonly referenced during the early church period, the first few centuries. Um, why? Because Sunday represents the day of resurrection, Okay, and why would he mention he's doing this? Hey guys, I was worshiping. I wish I was with you worshiping. I want to be back with you instead of worshiping alone because it doesn't say he was with anybody. So I'm pretty certain he was worshiping alone, which makes sense in a penal colony. This guy is trouble. No of the other prisoners want anything to do with him because they don't want to get in trouble. So he's just having his own little worship service at home by himself. And he's worshiping, he's saying, Lord, I love you, and, you know, whatever you say, maybe even you know, speaking in tongues, whatever it is. And then suddenly his worship is interrupted by a voice like a trumpet. Have you ever heard a trumpet play? That grabs attention. Okay, a trumpet has a very piercing tone, very unique. You hear a trumpet, you know what it is. Okay, now this voice was either God the Father speaking, or maybe it was Jesus. We don't know. It doesn't say. It doesn't matter. God and Jesus are one and the same anyway. Basically, he's telling them, write down these words. Whatever you see, whatever you hear, write them down on what? Well, probably had access to papyrus at some point. You could write it on that. That's a minor point to try to figure out. I'm sure he had a way to write. I'm sure, you know, there was ways for him to communicate. We don't know. Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't really matter. It's not a, not a case to worry about for your salvation. But he's basically told, write this down, and you're going to send it to these seven churches. And this writing is going to include everything that you're about to see. Now, it's interesting to note, most people believe that all these visions took place that one day. Well, why not? You know, Zechariah had, was it, eight visions in one day? <laughs> okay, or one night, actually. So it makes perfect sense, okay? So he's basically being told, you are going to write all this down. Now, strange as it may sound, this is where we're going to stop. What? We're still in the middle of the chapter. The best part's to come. Yes, I know. But if I went on to the remainder of this chapter, we'd be here for about another half hour. <laughs> Man, no, I don't want to do that to you. So we are, and, and to be honest, this is a good breaking point because the remaining part of chapter one is intimately related to chapters two and three. Because what's going to happen, and starting in, in the, the next verse, verse 12, John's going to describe Jesus. And you're going to hear those descriptions repeat themselves in chapters two and three in each of the, the individual messages to the individual churches. So instead of cutting it off and forgetting about it, because people tend to do that, because chapters tend to promote that type of behavior, we're going to go through the vision and then jump right into chapter 2 
and look at the uh, first uh, letter to the book, the, the, the church at Ephesus. Good stuff, but a lot. Some question. Sure. The letters that he sent to the churches after. Father, we thank you again for this time looking through your word. We looking or just looking forward to all the different messages here in Revelation that you have for us. There is just so much. And it's encouragement. Again, we, we've said this many times. This is not to scare us. This is not to put us into a panic. This is to comfort us that you control history yes. from beginning to end, A to Z. You, are the, you, Lord, are the one that carries every single one of us in your hand. Yes. And no matter what happens, we are within your care. And as it says, we are within your love. Yes. That love that never ends. Father, we ask you now to just continue to open our eyes. We want to be those, you know, to, as it says over and over again, we want to be the one who hears what the Spirit is saying to the churches because we are a church, Father. We are part of your church, and we thank you that we are here. We thank you that we have your word. We thank you that you, your Spirit is with us now. We ask you to give us traveling mercies as we head home tonight and bring us back safely next week. Again, we thank you for this little place we use as an office, but it works really nice for, mm -hmm. for Sunday afternoon service. Mm -hmm. We praise you now, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.